Okay, thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, our next um, act is a double act, actually. We've got two speakers, Professor Gordon McFiggins, uh, Professor of Atmospheric Multiphase Processes at Manchester University, and Professor Roy Harrison, OBE, Professor of Environmental Health and Risk Management at Birmingham University. Thank you. Great. Okay, well, thanks very much. Um, a slight switch in, well, a very large switch in emphasis to our atmospheric science interests. Um, both Roy and myself run groups looking at um, aeros atmospheric aerosol processes, atmospheric aerosol studies. That's looking at particulate material in the atmosphere. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the accidental research we've done into e-cigarettes over the last uh, couple of, well, few months, uh, and the reasons why it's been accidental research and what the relevance is to atmospheric science. So. First of all, just a bit of context for, for the secondary um, e-cigarette smoke. Um, particulate material is the single most important contributor to air quality um, in the UK and um, across developed countries. With 340,000 years of total survival time, the best estimate is what was lost in, uh, across the UK in 2008. That's not a good idea. Uh, anybody? Any? Ah, surely good. And that equates 200,000 annual premature deaths attributable to air pollution, higher than the 116,000 attributable, attributable to alcoholism, obesity and smoking combined. So it's, it's a big problem, the particulate in the ambient air, um, not just those that are deliberately inhaled. An estimated cost of particulate material in the UK of 15 to 40,000 uh, euros per emitted tonne in terms of mortality, just in terms of mortality costs. So, what does atmospheric particulate material comprise? Well, there's primary mechanically generated um, particulates, dust, pollen, etc., so things that are kicked up into the atmosphere and suspended. And then there's primary combustion smoke, things that are kicked out, um, attributable to both natural and man-made combustion, um, as particulates. Then there's secondary, so these are the things that are kicked out as gases that then form particles in the atmosphere through oxidation processes. And you can see here, um, you have natural contributions from forest emissions or smogs from um, organic compounds from man-made sources. Or there, there's just an experiment where you put orange peel in a flask, um, ozonalize it, and you can see the, the, the smog as second, uh, secondary product. And then there are primary or secondary um, contributions of volatile particles, things that come out of like aerosol cans, they're squirted out as particles and they can evaporate in the atmosphere. Um, water droplets that are... Con Sorry, water droplets that condense um, from the, the water vapour that comes out of kettles or uh, in the atmosphere from clouds. And you can see that these, um, these are formed by virtue of the, um, the vapour being above a saturation concentration. And then when they dilute or are warmed up, then those particles can actually disappear. Now, they're the sorts of particles that come out of e-cigarettes. And the combustion, the sooty particles, are the ones that uh, can come from um, traditional cigarettes. Now, our accidental research came about because I was looking for a way to calibrate some of our aerosol instruments. And the e-cigarettes the e provide a, a good way of producing very fine particles from uh, semi-volatile and volatile components. And so that was our original um, goal. And so what we do is, is try to generate particles uh, in the atmosphere uh, or in, in a chamber that simulate what goes on in the real atmosphere. So I've got a big bag of air, basically, at uh, the University of Manchester. And what we do is it's a Teflon bag, so it's quite clean. Um, and we, we fill it with very, very clean air, plus the ingredients that we want to look at in terms of their uh, atmospheric properties. So in terms of the, he uh, the health effects, perhaps, or climate effects of the particulates. And we simulate the solar spectrum by... Um, putting in the right amount of photons of the right amount of energy to stimulate the chemistry that goes on. And we use very, very clean dilution air, so it's parts per trillion by volume of the gases, um, uh, gases contaminants, or less than about one, uh, 0 0.1 millionth of a gram per cubic metre, so very, very low. So when we, um, when we look at the uh, components of interest, we can look at them at atmospheric ambient levels using research-grade instrumentation from uh, atmospheric science research, so sort of state-of-the-art stuff for online analysis. 
What we can do is inject in the individual chemicals as the precursors to particles, or the particles themselves, individual particles, or we can put real emissions. So here we take the emissions from plants, so these can be fig trees, birch trees, or whatever, squirt them into the bag, conduct the chemistry, and see what goes on. Or we can take a diesel engine and squirt some, you know, aliquots of the diesel exhaust, dilute it down to ambient levels, and see what the exposure, uh, see what the, the chemistry is that goes on. And we can, as I said, sample with research-grade online atmospheric instruments. So there's mass spectrometry, online mass spectrometry instruments, particle sizing, particle counting, or we can take offline analysis on filters. We can do a whole range of things. We could even put um, some sampler for, for toxicology, this sort of thing. We can, we can do things online at ambient concentrations with atmospheric processing. And so this was a real look-see to see what came out of the electronic cigarettes. You can see here it's a first generation um, electronic cigarette. We're sampling into a, a container, then squirting this into our bag, and then letting um, the chemistry go on under illumination, under different oxidant conditions, etc. Um, now, one thing to note here we're taking, when we're not looking at a dose that is necessarily the fugitive emissions from what comes out of an electronic cigarette, we're taking what will be sucked in. And so this rep the, the loadings in here represent what will be taken in from a number of puffs um, that we're, we're putting into the, uh, into the chamber. Now, the material that goes in through the filter is the same as what would, be ex uh, would come out into the atmosphere largely as the fugitive emission, unlike with normal cigarettes, which the smoke from the tip is not necessarily the same as that which comes through the filter. So we can look at the particle size, number, composition, changes with time, etc. And we're looking at 10 five-second puffs diluted into our 18 cubic meter bag. So I'm sorry for the, the next few dry slides. I'll try and summarize them for those that can't sort of pull it out from the, uh, from the technical perspective. But I'll try and also point out the important points. So we squirt the puffs in. And you see the number of particles per cc up here. You can see that it decays with time over a couple of hours. And this is the mass, and you can see it also decays with time, but it sort of decays off more um, from, its base, from its initial injection. So we've got about 20,000 particles per cc with about 4 microgram per cubic metre at the beginning, and they fall off with time, um, the mass falling off faster than the number. Because the mass falls off faster than the number, you know that the particles are getting smaller, so they're not just depositing, they're evaporating over that period of time. Also, this is a complicated plot. It shows the size of the particles evolving with time. I wouldn't home in too much on this plot other than to say this is the time evolution of the size of the particles, and I'll come on to show what the snapshots of these uh, distributions were. Now, you can also see here a fairly simple mass spectrum. I'm not going to go into any details. I can talk about this offline for, for ages. But basically, the first mode and the second mode, so with time, so going along here, they're pretty much identical. And they're fairly simple mass spectra. This is electron impact ionization um, for those that understand it. So it fragments things a lot. But basically, it's going to be indicative of the propylene glycol plus the nicotine plus the flavorings, not very much else. And it doesn't change with time. Okay? So they're evaporating, doesn't change with time. Quite high numbers, small particles, low mass concentration, simple concentration, doesn't change much. That was in, ah, and the size distributions, about 100 nanometers here um, in the first mode, um, well, 80 to 100 nanometers, and about 40 nanometers, most of this mode here. That's just the evolution across there. So that's the evaporation of the distribution. If you do, if you use, uh, do these experiments in the light and with ozone, you can see pretty much the same sort of trend. Mass goes down faster than the number. You can see, however, that there is a slight change in that the oxidation at ambient ozone levels, these are only ozone levels that you find in the ambient atmosphere. We're not hitting it with tons of oxygen. You can see that there is a change to the composition of these particles that we're going to be exposed to. So, and 44 is um, a decarboxylation product. It's a CO2 plus fragment for anyone that's interested, but that means that these are indicative of acids. Okay. Um, but they're very low, at very low levels and it's a small change. Just for comparison, these are from um, traditional cigarettes, and you're talking about similar number concentrations, but about two orders of magnitude more mass. Um, 
and a very complex mass spectrum with aromatic components and the, um, the particles from diesel engines you can see here again very much more mass but uh, similar sorts of numbers and from cleaning products you can see that you get very very much more mass this is just from ambient cleaning products you can get 200 microgram per cubic meter at levels reported in the indoor environment so very very much more exposure from those sorts of products I'm not going to go through those conclusions again. I'm going to let you, Roy talk a little bit about what the impact of those sorts of levels might be. Right, thank you, Gordon. My, my job is to try and put these numbers into some sort of public health context, which, which I would say is not easy. Uh, and I, I should stress that what we're talking about is someone actually um, inhaling in a very shallow way uh, from an e-cigarette and then, then exhaling uh, into the atmosphere and we're looking at what happens uh, uh, to that exhaled material and what concentrations we get from it. If they inhale deeply into the lung and then exhale, uh, there will not be nearly so much material coming out, but of course the individual doing the inhaling is getting a fairly huge exposure. So it, first of all, if we compare the size of the chamber to, to that of a small room, uh, the chamber is about half the size of a small room in a typical home. And if we work through a calculation, working out what mass we get per puff, uh, deriving directly from the data that Gordon measures in the chamber, and then um, taking that to uh, a factor of one half, because our room is twice as big as the chamber, uh, we can actually get to a concentration per puff in the room and then we, we create a scenario where we have five smokers in our room each generating five puffs per minute and they do that for 10 minutes and we saw the concentration were pretty stable over a period of 10 minutes so this would build up from the additional material coming in and the calculation leads us to an implied concentration of 50 micrograms per cubic meter now what does that mean in public health terms well we have regulations, we have air quality objectives, we have w, WHO uh, guidelines for fine particle mass expressed as PM2.5. And if you go out in London today, you've probably got a concentration somewhere around 15 micrograms per cubic metre with a WHO guideline of 25 micrograms per cubic metre as a 24-hour average or 10 micrograms per cubic metre as an annual mean. So we're looking at a concentration that is not hugely above what is typically around in the atmosphere. Uh, it is associated with human health impacts, but they're not likely to be uh, huge in comparison to the background air quality that we're subjected to in any case in, in a large city. What's perhaps more of concern is the particle number concentration, because particle number is a measure of the nanoparticles present. These are the particles less than 100 nanometers in diameter. They dominate the number count of particles. And because they have more surface area per unit mass than coarser particles, uh, they are considered by many to be more toxic, although the evidence for that is somewhat limited. But the most recent epidemiology from London, which is the uh, study from Richard Atkinson's group at uh, St. George's in 2010, showed a statistically significant association between the particle number concentration and cardiovascular mortality. So these are almost, I mean, that, that is a statistical association, but most people would believe it causal. So these are a health risk. Now, the initial particle count in the chamber was around 20,000 particles per cc. If I go through the same calculation of allowing for the, the larger uh, room than the chamber uh, and the scenario of the five smokers, then I get a implied concentration of 250,000 particles per cc. And put that into context, a typical urban concentration such as you might measure outside here in London at the moment is around 10,000 particles per cc and the 250,000 per cc would well exceed concentrations measured alongside busy roads. So I think if there is a public health risk, it is probably associated with the particle number concentration. So just to pull this together as some conclusions, 
should stress the, these are very much preliminary data. They need to be repeated and extended. Uh, they provide evidence for a possible exposure risk to passive smokers in enclosed spaces with, with limited ventilation if all the emissions from e-cigarettes were exhaled. Uh, and, and I believe this is quite a popular practice amongst some. Um, particle mass concentrations are about 100-fold lower than from conventional cigarettes, but the particle number concentrations are similar if the uh, smoke is directly exhaled. Um, the health risks are likely to be smaller than those associated with conventional cigarettes, I'm pleased to say, but that further measurements, and particularly those related to the nanoparticle number concentrations, are very strongly recommended. And I'll finish there. Thank you very much. <laughs>